Our next presentation is from Joey Bazowska. Joey is the Assistant Professor of Design and Computation Arts at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. She's the Research Director of XS Labs, and she has a whole team of people developing innovative methods and applications in electronic textiles and responsive garments. She's also a member of the Hexagram Research Group, so thank you, Joey. All right, testing. Um, is, is it on? Okay. I guess she just, she's just gonna put it on for a minute. Just a minute while we get Joey's mic working. So I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank V2 for hosting us today. Uh, and so far, it's been a very exciting day. What I've brought to show you is a small part of what we do at XS Labs. So in order to contextualize it, I'm going to speak for about five to seven minutes just about the overall research efforts of my lab. And XS Labs stands for Extra Soft Labs, as Tecla was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, and we do all kinds of things with electronic textiles. What I've brought today and what I will invite you to come and uh, look at and touch later on is um, our kinetic textile work. So this is an older dress called Kukia, um, which I'm going to turn on right now. There's this little circuit board here. And as I'm speaking, you'll be able to see these flowers moving around the neckline of the dress. You see this one is starting to move right now. Um, and uh, as I'll move through my presentation, I'll explain both some of the technology, some of the construction uh, aspects of using shape memory alloys in textiles, and uh, I'll also explain our methodology and our process in developing our latest project, which is the Scorpions project. All right, I'm just going to sit for a second. Um, so XS Labs, it's, I call it a design research studio. We have this thing in Canada that's called research creation or recherche création. So we really work at two levels where there's hardcore technical development and then um, that technical development or those technical technology explorations are really driven by a creative practice or a need to develop something within an art practice sort of context. So we have both technical research directions and more artistic or conceptual research directions. In terms of the technical stuff, we really focus on electronic textiles. So a big part of that is what I call soft computation or soft electronics. Um, and then two different ways that textiles can become visually interactive, that they can change state in visually. So one is to change color, and another one is to change shape. Uh, we also use illumination sometimes. Now everybody loves LEDs, blinking lights, but we really are mostly interested in how to get textiles to truly change color and change shape using shape memory materials uh, and various chemical materials that can change color under different stimuli. So in terms of color change, uh, fabric substrates, we both work even with simple explorations using thermochromic inks that can change color through a change in temperature. And this is a photo from a series of dresses that we did that when you touch, when there is heat from both sides of the fabric, the spots disappear. So it's this metaphor of erasing the camouflage on somebody else's body through physical touch. And this idea of being able to affect uh, the way somebody else looks through physical contact. And also you can talk about this in terms of branding, being able to erase messages on other people's clothes or erasing the pattern, but having this physical power over somebody else's appearance. This is an old technology. Thermochromic inks have been around since the 60s. One of the things that we do that is innovative technically is to activate the color change instead of with body heat to use electronics and what's called resistive heating. And we also use resistive heating for these guys. Uh, what resistive heating means is you pass electricity directly through a fiber that has some resistance. It's conductive, but it also has some resistance. And then because it has some resistance, part of that energy is converted to heat energy. So this is an example of a weaving where these brown spots can turn yellow or pink. And this is, these are examples from a more personal piece that I did, which uh, it's called Krakow. I'm Polish originally. 
It's called Krakow, a story of erasure and disappearance or something like that. So there are figures in this weaving that disappear over time. You see, this is my scientific illustration. But these, these figures, these persons are erased both from memory, from a place. So it talks about displacement, immigration, people being ripped out from one place into another, but also how our memories of people and places disappears over time. Um, in terms of shape change fabric substrates, you're seeing kukia. Kukia means flower in Finnish. That's because this was uh, the student who worked on this with me was from Helsinki. Her name is Hannah Soder. She's a fantastic, this is a photo of her. She's a brilliant, brilliant textile artist. Um, just as a side note, I'm not going to talk too much about technology stuff, but one of my ex-research assistants put together this great website um, which I can give you the URL later, but you can download our ISWIC paper here about the Kukia project that has all of the technical details. Uh, how we manufacture the shape memory alloys, uh, the microcontroller stuff, uh, all of the fabrication issues, etc. So I just wanted to mention that right away. And there's also a video, and he works so hard. Um, we've also been doing a whole bunch of other explorations. So you can see here the flowers are very decorative. It's really a decorative element, the same way you would wear a brooch or something that just augments your garment. The new project where I brought prototypes, the Scorpions project, consists of a series of six dresses where the garments themselves move and change over time, restructure themselves, and sort of are violent and perverse and almost hurt your body in different ways. So we've been doing a lot of explorations about different ways we can move textiles using shape memory alloys. In terms of soft electronics, we do everything from weaving complex structures with conductive threads to create things like electrodes or antenna or sensors, um, embroidery, stitching. So um, Sue was mentioning earlier today how, you know, especially with textiles, electronic textiles, how there is this very interesting clash or conflation or relationship that be, uh, is constructed between traditional technologies, because weaving is a technology, you know, sewing is a technology, all of those things are technologies, they're just very, very old. So we don't think of them as technologies in the common vernacular. Um, and newer technologies and new materials. So in fact, a lot of the reasons why uh, our work is quite successful and we make things work is because we are very much inspired by tradition and traditional ways of constructing things. So we use all of these things like weaving, stitching, embroidery, etc. And these are just some details. In terms of conceptual research directions, uh, and this is where the art part of our work comes in, we are very interested in history and memory, and this has been a theme throughout the day so far, how uh, garments are this interface between the body and this external space, how they are marked not only by things like sweat or skin cells or tears, you know, if we want to be melodramatic, or food, if you want to be silly. Um, um, but also how they can be marked and shaped uh, electronically using these new technologies, right? So that those meanings can then be augmented and manipulated using digital technologies. These histories, these things are recorded. Um, uh, pattern and repetition, and also we really like to do things that are irreverent and even perverse, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is one of our more popular projects because it's very simple. Uh, and it's similar to a lot of other work where touch history can be recorded on the body. So like Despina's uh, hug jackets that Sue showed earlier, where the circuit is completed when you hold somebody and there is that physical contact. So here we have these stitched on, um, they're basically variable resistors made out of conductive organza. And when somebody touches you or gropes you, the intensity of the grope or the touch is reflected by the intensity of the illumination of this analog circuit that has little um, surface-mounted LEDs on it. Uh, and also then it fades over time to show how long it's been since you've had this intimacy event, as we call it. And this is similar, except it has a little microphone and breath events on your neck. When somebody blows on your neck or whispers to you are similarly recorded. Um, so when we show this project, it's obviously kind of sexy, funny, you know, personal. It breaches personal boundaries in most cultures. 
um, but also it opens the door to discussion about things like the difference between private space and public space and what's going to start happening once we do start embedding different sensor technologies in this very intimate area, which is uh, this second skin of sorts. Who is going to own that information? Who is going to have access to that information? What kinds of legislative models will need to be developed to legislate this information? You know, um, for instance, now if we think of our cell phones, I think most mobiles now have GPS chips in them, so every time you make a call, whoever's tracking that call also knows exactly where you are. Once, you know, and these, we don't realize it, but these legislative models are in place, mostly driven by uh, North American culture of paranoia, etc. But um, these technologies, um, anyway, I'm getting off track, but history and memory. <laughs> these are, I have a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, this is a similar project that records physical touch and displays it in different ways using the inks, using different recording devices. Uh, so your whole history of physical interaction with somebody else is really recorded by this garment and then displayed in a slightly provocative, slightly aesthetic way. Um, we're very interested in pattern and repetition and uh, those are intrinsic to textile manufacturing throughout history because weaving and knitting is all about repeating patterns. Um, but now we can start creating new patterns using various digital technologies. This is an example, this is with Vincent Leclerc, another one of my old research assistants, um, with these five LEDs in the sleeve that when you close the snaps, the LEDs turn on, so they're both the switch and the output, and they start flashing in a seemingly random pattern. But when you start moving your arm or running or moving through the city, your sleeve actually starts leaving text behind. It's what's called retinal persistence. It's like those cl LED clocks that move back, the one line of LEDs that when it moves back, it actually shows the time. So you can uh, annotate the city or annotate public space just by moving through the space. But when you stand still, it's only noise. When you move through space, it becomes a message. Um, this is a very bizarre project I won't go into, but basically looking at, um, these are these modules we constructed called the octopus, and they have every sensor you can possibly imagine and communication, et cetera. Uh, and we use them as a platform for exploring different kinds of uh, patterns that can happen when you put them on your body or on different bodies and what kinds of information is communicated and how it's represented. In terms of unexpected and irreverent textiles, which kind of feed into our Scorpions project, we've done all kinds of explorations, such as creating dresses that actually show touch on the body. We have, uh, through the hexagram research facilities, we have access to these really nice textile printers and looms. Uh, so we can very quickly prototype fabrics and garments with different kinds of uh, designs on them. So we did a lot of explorations where with my students, with my research assistants, I asked them to touch their own bodies and touch each other's bodies. And then we drew that and then printed it on fabric and constructed these dresses that show the history of touch that was um, contained and touch that breached boundaries between people. We've also worked a lot with inflatable garments. So this is a dress you can inflate yourself on the shoulder. Uh, to create these bulges, and we call this the distract dress. So if you feel threatened or something, you can quickly inflate it to confuse the enemy, but also create this buffer of personal space around you. Um, this is the last project I'm going to show before I actually move into this work. Uh, this is also with Vincent Leclerc, and these are the sound sleeves, which produce a sound frequency based on your body language. So the more you cross your arms or squeeze your arms together, the higher and more uncomfortable the frequency. And as you relax and open your arms, the frequency becomes lower and almost like a cat purring. So it very directly augments your body language. Okay, in terms of shape change, um, this is, I just wanted to show a little bit of this video because Kukia is part of a series of two dresses, Kukia and Vilkas, where Kukia has these flowers that decorate the neck and it's almost like a caress, you know, it's close to your face, it's very sensual, the movement is very organic because we're using textiles. And then the second, the sister dress is called Vilkas and it has a hemline that goes up and down on its own. What was really, and you know, and clothes do that anyway. I mean, if you're wearing like polyester with nylons, a polyester dress, <laughs> and like 
<laughs> and nylons on your legs, you know, your dress will go up. Except this one does it uh, in an electronically controlled manner. Um, and these are my poor students <laughs> who are hating having to perform. Um, but what was really important with both of these projects, which then also really feeds the Scorpions project, is I s really stay away from digital interactivity. I think that there's a lot of other people doing very exciting work with interactivity, and I'm much more interested in just constructing garments that are almost like living creatures, that are these monsters or creatures that sit on your body and have their own behavior that sometimes is complementary to your needs and your desires and sometimes is completely antithetical to your needs and your desires. They have a mind of their own and they move and change and perhaps even hurt you. So we recently got uh, our first chunk of funding, which is for art alone. Most of my funding comes from this like research creation sort of stuff, so we need to do a lot of technology development. But we recently got an Arts Council grant to develop the Scorpion dresses. So what we've been doing is just using our existing technology stuff that we had developed earlier and just really focusing on uh, the concept, the idea of these garments that are kinetic and transformable and that shift on your body in a way that is perhaps painful or undesirable. And I brought some of the prototypes here that I will demonstrate, but since the group is so big, I also took some quick video that I'm going to show. Oh, sorry for the typo. Uh, it's been a very long process. We've been working on this for about six months and exploring different kinds of mechanisms, uh, including the anus, <laughs> which is like a hole that can shrink and then get bigger. Um, um, different mechanisms of uh, different ways that we can manipulate textile on the body to make, so this is a prototype for you know, a dress that has a big hole that then squeezes and then opens again. So we, these are just very, very rough prototypes that we've been doing with the shape memory alloy called nitinol, which is what we use. Um, and based on maybe three months worth of explorations, then we um, deployed various sorts of brainstorming methodologies to come up with our collection of six dresses. So because you know, I like to think of them as creatures, we really started out by thinking of animals and also thinking of sins. So that's why you see here Venus, although that's not an animal, it's a plant. Um, one of the dresses is based around Venus and the sin is gluttony and it's about consumption. So it's a dress that consumes your body. And all the dresses have relationships between them. I mean, we've, we did so much brainstorming, etc. So the, the Venus, uh, we really wanted it to move on your body and sort of close your head as if it were consuming your head. And these are some of the mechanisms that we explored to have this kind of action on your body, to have these petals or these wings that, uh, that enclose your head. And I hope you can see this video. So this is a piece of our felt moving back and forth with the night and all. And I have another video right here. And I also brought this piece so you can all come later and see it up close. So this is how it curls and how, you know, it's, it's kind of aggressive, but it's also very organic and it's, it's almost this tension between a caress and, some, and a slap, you know, a slap in the face. Uh, we've been doing all kinds of prototypes. Some of them I brought, some of them I didn't. Um, depending on how you construct it, these textiles can move in a more violent or softer way. And you see these are still all kind of like a little Frankenstein, you know. There's, you can see all the stitching, etc., because they're prototypes. But the final product, we're planning to embed all of these conductive threads and all of the shape memory alloys directly in the felt. Uh, if you download the paper, you'll see that we're using felt for two reasons. One is that it provi provides a relative rigidity, which allows the shape to go back to its, not to its original shape but it also has fire retardant properties, which is important once you're passing electricity through a textile. This is our little uh, squid or jellyfish. These, this was just an experiment with knitting or with crochet, I think, or maybe knitting, I don't remember. Kind of the anus idea again. <laughs> you know, as soon as things start moving on the body, it's easy to kind of start thinking of other body things. And um, 
And this is even more decorative sorts of things, so knitting right around the night and all to make shapes that pulse or open and close. Um, and the very last image I'm going to show you is based on all of those explorations, based on all of the prototypes. Um, I'm working with Di Mainstone, who's a fashion designer from London, uh, who worked for like Topshop or something like that for a long time and then became interested in electronic fashions a couple of years ago. And we're now in the final stage of building the actual costumes. So this one is based around the snail. So it's something that's very kind of heavy and kind of constricts you like a snail. So you can't move very quickly. But then there's also this slime that you leave behind you. This, it's actually a silk, a silk kind of lining, but it's kind of slimy. And it opens and closes and moves up and down with the night and all. Uh, so even though you're very constrained and heavy on top, you kind of have these things that move across your legs. And these are, this was the very first prototype of the snail that she sculpted out of foam. And then based on this, she c cut it apart and constructed the pattern. And this is her first test with her pattern. This is a photo of our lab. And a bit of a, you know, it's highly technical what she does. It looks like there's numbers and little lines. Um, so now I think what's best is uh, I can take some questions or for the next 10 minutes maybe in smaller groups people can come here and I can just show the actual prototypes. I'm going to leave this slide up because I want to thank all of my research assistants as well as the funding agencies in Canada which are really incredible and that make this work possible. I will... Uh Pass on the microphone when somebody has a question for uh, Joey. Is there somebody from the audience who wants to know anything? <laughs> uh, can we use this technology in order to make own work, our work, so that you can read about process and how to make. Yeah, so nitinol exists. It's a yeah. shape memory alloy that also has been around since the 60s. Uh, the reason it hasn't, it's been used in textiles in a couple of different ways, but never in an electronically controlled way. And there's many reasons for that. A lot of them have to do with legislation and the lack of standards for electronic textiles. And everybody's terribly afraid of being sued or of, you know, seriously injuring people. There's no standards. It's actually a very... Um, tricky thing to be developing in a commercial sense. But you can work with nitinol um, and um, what we do is we actually work with material, we, we're very lucky because in Montreal we have the Center for Nitinol Research, that's the center in all of Canada, it happens to be down the street from my lab. So we've just started working with them recently, but before that we were just working with the materials engineer, you need a furnace, you need to really control the temperature at which you shape the material. So you need to constrain the material around what's called a mandrel to give it its shape and then bake it at a very specific temperature for a very specific amount of time. Um, you know, so all of these things are feasible. Yeah. But how, how long would it take us, let's say, I mean, you've done the research, obviously, but how long would it take somebody who doesn't know anything about it uh, in order you, to start working with it? If you have access to uh, the furnace, it could take like a week. I mean, it's really not that difficult as long as you read my paper. <laughs> uh, we can take one more question from the audience. And I would also like to invite people to visit uh, Joey at a little table for the demonstrations <laughs> uh, during the tea break, if that's OK uh, with you, Joey. Yeah. Uh, is there another question from the audience? Um, I do know this material a little bit, and I know it works also on heat. Why don't you develop um, some way of not using electricity, which is difficult? Because, um, you mean, so using body heat instead? For instance, or yeah. maybe some uh, machine. I know, not a machine, but s some way to develop yeah. heat to well, deform you know, it. Heat is a form of energy, right? So of course, um, yeah. So electricity is another form of energy, and it just happens to be a convenient uh, way that we generate the heat. If you were to use body heat, you would need to have nitinol that activates at close to body temperature, maybe 32 degrees, which is kind of a reasonable skin temperature. But then once it deforms, it would stay activated because the temperature would not go down. 
So we want, uh, we work with a material that deforms, it's called its AF, it's, um, that's the temperature at which it remembers its shape, between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. The reason we do that is we want it to go back to its other shape very quickly. So we need to keep that temperature higher than ambient and higher than body temperature. And it's actually the most efficient thing to do to use a little bit of electricity using the natural resistance of the material to generate the heat. So we're using actually very low, you know, uh, like these flowers use about uh, eight volts at like 500 milliamps just for like a couple of seconds. So it's actually very low. But then why there, there's this discussion about using the electricity in the clothing? Because even using the most minimal amount of electricity running through a fiber that's potentially flammable is something that is yeah. not legislated yet, and there's no standards organizations that uh, are regulating it. Mm -hmm. So it's more a question of regulating it first, um, so you have this legislative um, cushion in yeah. case something okay. goes wrong. Thank you. Okay. One, one more question. Um, you talked, uh, um, it, I, I'm guessing that one of the reasons you're using electricity is that you're taking the kind of human, the body out of the equation you know, they don't actually, the body doesn't have control in any sense over, over what you're doing. I'd also not like to ask you about the kind of, the, the context really, the, the snail, the idea of kind of, um, you know, sort of restricting the body. What, 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 are, what, is, your, what is your sort of um, thesis behind that? Well, we have um, many different ways that I talk about it. One of them deals with the history of fashion and how, you know, throughout history and across different cultures. Fashion, mostly for women, but for men also, does have a history of constricting the body and inflicting pain and deforming the body. You know, so on one hand, we're looking at new technologies as just providing yet another way of doing that. Um, or, and technologies, no matter what they are, old or new, do change our social patterns and do change our space, our place in the world in relation to the outside. Uh, so that's one way that I talk about it. Another way is um, also to have this kind of humorous, um, I guess, discussion around the fact of how little we actually can control most of our digital technologies and how much we actually do play by the rules set by whoever designed those technologies, even though we have this illusion of empowerment. Um, it's really an illusion most of the time. Uh, so that's another way that I talk about it. Uh, and I also just like this, the perversion of it, you know, that it's a very perverse sort of idea that it's almost like the garments are wearing you instead of you wearing the garments. Um, so it's, it just, it's my sense of humor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Big hand for Joey. <laughs> We're moving on now. I'm not sure where she is. Christina. And she holds an MA in wearable computing and an MSc in tangible objects in virtual spaces. She's an artist in residence, as I said, at Stein, but she has also worked as a research fellow at the Interaction Institute Ivrea in Italy. And she is also an honorary visiting design fellow at the University of York. So thank you very much, Christina. OK, am I working? You can you hear me? Good. OK, so I am uh, like Joey. I'm just going to show a little bit of images first. Uh, before actually showing some blinking things, uh, <laughs> as you do. And uh, basically what I've decided to talk about today is a little bit different from what uh, you've seen so far. I've become more and more interested in this idea of naive electronics. Um, the more and more we can do of really complex stuff, the further away ordinary people are from uh, actually understanding the devices they're around. So I've become quite obsessed about trying to figure out how we think about the switches and the sensors and the little lights and the circuits that we're using in these types of projects. 
Um, so this is a little bit of blurb. Don't read it. I'll tell it instead. Basically, the idea is that once you put sensors into things, they become different. They become hybrid objects. And we have to create new imaginations about how they work. And uh, these ideas are sort of related to this concept from, inter uh, from artificial intelligence called naive physics. Naive physics is a sort of system that people use to think about the world, even if they don't actually know anything about the particle physics, for example, that is governing the atoms around them. Most people don't actually understand modern physics, but they're still able to do the washing up. Uh, because, you know, there's a level of physics that is simply how you experience it. Um, so uh, the physicist would say that naive physics or folk physics is the untrained human perception of basic physical phenomena. I'm sort of trying to look at a similar thing, but for electronics. And of course, this is also related to hacking. This is something we haven't talked about today yet. But hacking is this notion of taking objects and changing them and quite often giving them new uh, abilities and quite often some of those abilities are results of a glitch or a mismatch the way Anne talked about it earlier. And so what uh, Nick Collins say in he has a wonderful list of rules for hardware hacking and one of the things he says is that if it sounds good and it doesn't smoke don't worry if you don't understand it. And that's uh, sort of how I often do my things. Um, so basically, I'm, doing, uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, busy with this stuff, trying to figure out how to make objects that investigate how we think about these things. So I'm going to show uh, some stuff from three different projects, and then I'm going to turn on some things afterwards. Uh, the first thing is not really a project. Rather, it's sort of an ongoing teaching method that I've been developing together with Stuck, who's standing over there in the bar in a stripy cardigan. Uh, he got a spotlight and everything. And uh, Stuck is a wonderful guy, and he knows everything there is to know about electronics, and now he's blushing. And um, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a happy amateur. I'm, I'm a dork. I don't, you know. So together we are developing this idea because uh, in the process of teaching artists, performance students, media theorists, and other people who al also don't know how to turn on a soldering iron, we're interested in how to teach these people to um, create their own things in order to develop an understanding of what electronics can be. And the way we decided to do it is that these people, these students really don't, really don't want a course in electronics. I mean, a lot of them are in art school simply because they're trying to avoid that kind of thing. And so what we're doing instead is we're uh, taking an approach that I kind of think of, of as color by numbers. And what that basically means is that before teaching them anything about electronics, we make them do some things that work. So here's, uh, if I can have a cursor, here's Alex talking about his thing. If I have some sound, can I have some sound on my computer? I think they send signals. One is a receiver, So when something goes. But I haven't changed everything because. So, basically, he's trying to explain what is his build, and he doesn't actually really know much about it, but he's getting that he's making two devices, and if you put your hands between them, you get a signal. And now he's at the point where he's trying to figure out what to do with it. So what we tend to do is that we get from this point to, to sort of uh, trying to make some things that you can actually use. This is Nancy. Nancy has made a thing that changes her voice. She's very happy about it. But basically, this is actually all about... <laughs> so, I mean, these are people who have never soldered before. So they're suddenly building things that are allowing them to do things they couldn't do before. Um, and, and this sort of leads on to this next thing, that you get these glitches. You basically, what we're doing is we're taking these kits. They're sort of do-it-yourself kits aimed for 12-year-old boys, I think. And uh, you can typically build your own radio sender uh, or something like that. And uh, by giving them to, to, to these, these students, they're ending up modifying them so that they end up having behaviors that weren't really meant to be. This is, for example, supposed to be a cricket. 
Okay. Uh, this was a cricket before, and it has these light sensors on it that uh, control the, the pitch and the frequency. And also there's one wire here that you can touch to change the modulation. So David here is a musician, as you can probably tell. Um, so this is sort of the things that we're interested in, and this is the, uh, the other thing that then happens is that by building these very simple things and starting to daisy chain them up together, you can make objects that has behaviors, and some of those behaviors are sort of accidental, but it gives, there's a, sort of a next step of thinking about what can we do with it. This is two people who are, two girls who are studying at the school for uh, performance studies in Amsterdam. So what's happening is that their hands are connecting the circuit, so they're getting a sound while they're touching each other. So uh, you sort of see what's happening is that because they don't really know how these things are supposed to work, they're actually having a really great way of working with what they're perceived to be doing. And this is incredibly simple electronics. It's all analog. And uh, all of these devices that they're using are things they have built themselves, which is also has there's a whole point to, to um, about ownership there. Uh, the next thing I'm, I want to show, I have to show another thing as a background. Um, the boxes that you see on this table are sort of coming from this project, and I'm going to just show a minute of it or so, just to give you some context for where this is coming from. It's a project called Ensemble, and it was a set of dressing up clothes that I made for children. And the clothes aren't just secondhand clothes. But what they're doing is each piece of clothing has a sensor in it. And I give them to four to five-year-old children, they play around with them, and I'm interested in seeing how they deal with that. What, 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 how do they feel that these things are working? And each thing has a very simple sensor. The first thing I'm going to show is a light sensor. It's sitting inside a bag, so obviously when you close the bag, it gets dark, etc. So it's kind of interesting to see how they're experimenting with it. And one of the things that I really like about what they're doing is that they're using the angle to the light, which is something I didn't actually think about before I made it, which is sort of the whole point of this. Uh, let me see if this one... You'll hear a swoosh in the background. That's a dress, but that's not really important now. Okay, and basically what then happens is that the kids play around like this, and then after an hour or so, their parents come back, and they sit around, and they explain to their parents how these things work, and this is sort of the best part.
before I did this project, everybody thought I was insane for using light sensors. They thought it was a boring sensor to use, but it's actually the most interesting one to use. Here's another, uh, there's uh, seven pieces of clothing all in all, but you get the general idea. And sometimes it's also about looking at movement. This dress has an accelerometer in the hem. So uh, I should also say, technically, these things are wor using hacked wireless game controllers as their technical platform. I'd be happy to tell you guys about that later if anybody wants to come and catch me. It's a good, cheap way of getting wirelessness, for particularly if you haven't done it before. So now what I'm going to show is that I have two sets of boxes up here. Uh, it's important to note that these are not designs. These are not products. I'm really not suggesting that it's a great idea to put everything in a big black plastic box. That's really not what I'm trying to do. But these things are just my attempt of taking these sensors and giving them some sort of physical surface so that we can explore them. And again, this is a catch-up. The black boxes are a catch-up from the dressing up project, where I'm trying to put these, a number of these sensors in the boxes and having kids play with them and explain to me how they think they work. So they're uh, typically input-output boxes, as simple as I can possibly make them. Um, and they're sitting in a ray. I'm at the moment working with light, sound, and touch. So you know there'll be a light input, light output box, and a sound input, light output box. You get the general idea. And I have most of them with me today, but I'm in the process of building them. So I'm afraid there's a couple of them that are still in process back at the lab. Um, and this is some footage from yesterday where um, Sophie had a look at these boxes for me um, for the first time. So I'm just going to show a couple of these. This is Sophie looking at the sound to light box. Hello. <laughs> she speaks from Hungarian, just to make my life more interesting. <laughs> so, uh, of course, what happens is when you work with children a lot, and I really have a tendency of of, use it, of being with children as my collaborators, because I find that um, it's very useful to uh, if if your project makes sense to a five-year-old, it's probably pretty sound. If it doesn't make sense, if you can't explain it to a five, six-year-old, it's probably because you're relying heavily on rhetoric. Um, so I find that they're, they're very good at calling me out. And you know, if it's boring, they'll tell me. And that's useful. And, um, but also, of course, what happens is that they never quite do what you think they will do. So the things that I got out of yesterday were uh, most of the, the ways that, that Sophie was thinking about these boxes were really what they sort of looked like to her. And this, this particular box was uh, reminding her of making recordings in the theater. Her parents are theater makers. Um, this one is one of the uh, light in touch out boxes. And uh, I'm just going to show a second of the video. But what's interesting is ha also how concentrated she is. I don't tell her what these boxes do, I just turn them on and give them to her and see what she does. She takes it very seriously. So yeah. this... Mm. Okay, this is a touch to light box. Whenever you touch the box, the light goes on. Uh -huh. mm. It's a, it, it sh the first thing she said was that it's like a, a little uh, fairy, f very far away. Oh, yeah. Oh, shatito. Yeah, and it's also in the dark. <laughs> so this is the light to sound yeah. box. You will not know what. You saw my gas? You can't really hear it, but it squeaks uh, in the light. Uh, 
and the last one is a uh, light to light box, but I'm going to skip past that. So another the other set of boxes I'm going to show, I'm just going to show this and then turn some boxes on, is sort of at the sort of a, a, a little off shot of this is a series of boxes that I made together with a choreographer called Nora Hillman. And what it simply is, is light to sound boxes. And we, uh, last week, we did an experiment at the Schauberg in Amsterdam where we had five performers sitting in the bar uh, wearing goggles that gave them input only of white light. This is sort of a reference to the Gansfield experiment, which Tekla will know about. Um, and basically the idea is, if you wear these white goggles, you, your brain is getting no visual stimuli. So what happens is you hallucinate, because your brain just starts doing stuff. And everybody will have a different experience. So what we did was we put goggles on people, gave them a task to move from the ground floor in the Schauberg to the top floor bar in the Schauberg during a very busy event. And, um, and what they have instead are these noise boxes and a series of rules for navigation. And I'm just going to skip by this. Here you can see the goggles. Looks very freaky. And what they're doing is we've been basically asking them to investigate the light without being able to see it. Okay, you get the general idea. I think we should turn on some boxes. I think it's time. So I'll start with the black ones. Um, this one is good. It has a little bit of a shake, which I don't like. Everybody here who knows about electronics will know that it's never good when it makes a sound when you shake it. So this one should probably be um, treated with a little bit of carefulness. But you'll see it reacts to sound in a sort of obvious manner. But I think someone should maybe have a go and just pass it along. Well, it probably also reacts on shaking, but in an entirely unintentional manner. <laughs> like, it stops, probably. <laughs> well, it's in a reaction, you know. So just pass it around. Uh, and as you can see, these are th incredibly simple things. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm wireless. I keep thinking I'm wired. So you should probably turn that one on. And then let's see if you can figure out what it does. You can be my child for the day. How about that? <laughs> I'm just going to check if it's actually on. You might want to just flick the switch just to check. It, you will notice if it does something. It's pretty reactive. OK, we're going to leave this guy to try some things out here. And uh, you get to try this one. It can take a while before you get it. I mean, there's no shame in it at all. I'll do you get this one. This one you're allowed to shake. It won't break, I think. Do you want a hint? Try touching the metal things on the side. Yeah. Ah, we have action here. We have touch to sound. <laughs> See if you can figure this one out. So this is a point where the talk normally descends into total chaos. Um, just to make things worse, I'm just going to turn all of these on and distribute them. They make noise. Feel free to fight your, your way to actually getting a box. All of these are very temperamental, so they have slightly different sounds. I don't know, you have to imagine the scene of me sitting on the train this morning from Amsterdam changing all my batteries. And I was kept waiting for somebody trying to arrest me. So it looked very suspicious. There you go. I'm 
just going to pass them out. There you go. There you go. So um, if anybody has any questions, this is maybe a good time to try it. Excellent. Um, who, who has a question? Uh, the people in the front here are really enjoying themselves. Maybe you can also pass, pass things it on into the crowd. To the back. I'm sorry, but um, questions? Now everyone is busy, Christine. I know, that's yeah, a good I know. job. That's fine. We can that's have a an easy coffee. way to get rid of questions. Isn't it good? Yeah, that's 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 actually very good. I I will start, and people will probably come up with more uh, questions. Why? <laughs> I just want to react on your provocative uh, remark to, uh, that you use five-year-olds as your main reference points to test your concept. Yeah. Uh, can you get a little bit more Specific into detail uh, about, about that? that? Because it, it sounds very strange to me. It's sort of coming originally from a joke. There is this internet joke about um, ten things <laughs> that will... If you're an evil dictator, 10 things that'll stop you from getting caught in the end. And one of them is to have a five-year-old advisor who will be able to see through the flaws of your evil plan. Ah, okay. And, yeah. and it, it actually comes from, originally when I was an art student in Copenhagen, I had a, a weekend job in the science center. And it was excellent because you ha kept having these five-year-olds coming up to you and saying, what's the ozone layer? And you can't just give them a technical explanation. You have to be good at uh, finding um, a description. You have to think differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I find that a good way of stopping myself from getting into something that's too heavily reliant on rhetoric. Because okay. the rhetoric won't wash. So I'm actually hoping Anne uh, and Galloway can also uh, react on that. Uh, maybe now or in the final debate. <laughs> okay, like in the watch. final debate. She'll <laughs> keep it uh, for later. Is there any uh, question from the audience? You, you made them happy. That's a very good thing. You can, yeah, well, you know. Hi, Christina. I was wondering if you could just go into a little bit more detail about the Gansfeld oh, yeah, yeah, project sure. and how the performers were navigating oh, sure. through this space. What I can do is I can show you a little bit more video. Okay. Um, basically what they were doing, uh, what we did now was sort of the first experiment in the series. And uh, we gathered them in the theater. They were unprepared. They knew about the goggles. They had done one session with goggles only, but they didn't know the boxes. And uh, we, uh, we gave them a piece of paper with an instruction. And it's a very sort of generic sort of uh, recipe-like instruction. And we asked them to move from f four floors up in, this, in the Schauberg, I think, or three floors up, up the stairs. That was their task. And while doing so, they were turning their boxes off while they moved and turning whenever they found an interesting space they could turn their boxes on and investigate that space. So uh, we were just sort of interested in both the way they were. Here you see one of them. Am I having sound out from the computer? So it's in a way an internal experience for the, for the performer, more than it's a public event. We sort of just use the crowd as our environment. We could have done this on the light supply, which in fact I think we should do. And the glasses are again um, completely wiping out. They're just giving you white light input, so you see different levels of brightness. Okay. 
So I think another thing I'd like to mention to those people in the audience who are, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that there's quite a few people in the audience who don't have experience with building these types of things. Every single one of these boxes are incredibly simple to make. And I, I could, perf you know, anybody could literally make it with an hour or so of practicing. And it's really one of the things that I'm interested in is also to bring the ability to make these types of things, however simple they are, to people who might not necessarily be scientists or technologists or professional hardware developers. Just simply because it's my feeling that more interesting interfaces and more interesting uses of this will come out of, come out of such a thing. So it's, it's, it's very simple to do. And it's, it's just simply just a question of, of, of having a go. I think that's, that's an important point. Is there more questions or is, are there more questions from the audience? Okay, thank you very much and a big hand for Christina Anderson. <laughs> Susan uh, will demonstrate her current research uh, project, BioCouture. Uh, and this investigates the possibility of growing clothing using biocellulose. Susan has exhibited her work internationally, and as we uh, already noticed, she has <laughs> written this gorgeous book, Fashioning the Future. I'm trying to kind of talk Sorry. through the whole thing. I don't know what's happening. Okay, that, that was just a connector. And uh, it's for this uh, piece, not allowed to touch it. However, Susan brought samples of the material in various phases of the development with her. And uh, there you go. And you can touch and feel that in the tea break. And also you can kind of visit the other projects and have your hands on uh, experience with uh, all the demonstrations. Are you ready, Susan? Um, apart from its cutting off the bottom half. Uh oh. Of the and that's containing crucial information, I guess? Um, hmm. It's something to do with the, the settings on the display have been changed? Th th this, is, this is okay, so. Oh, okay, maybe that's. That's it, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, if people still have the boxes, keep them quiet by switching them off. And afterwards, please be our guest and turn them on again yep. as loud as you would like to. Can we maybe turn that light down a little bit? Is that possible? Thanks. Okay. Um, this is really low-tech compared to what we've just seen. There's nothing interactive or noise-making or anything about this project. Um, it's the first time I've talked about it, and it's the very beginnings of something. Um, so it's, it's kind of all a, a new thing to me. The way this project came about was um, actually during the, the course of the research for my book, I had conversations with many types of people from different backgrounds. And one of the most inspiring was a conversation I had with a scientist in an art gallery. And we got onto the subject of how else we might create clothing. And one of the options that he put to me was the idea that we could grow clothing, which completely blew my mind as a designer and subsequently started a series of conversations that have been going on for a couple of years between us now and have, have resulted in, a, in this project. Um, for me, as I mentioned, uh, I touched on earlier, the whole area of sustainability and fashion and textiles is becoming a real key issue. And, and I really felt that in the 21st century, there must be new ways of approaching the production of textiles and clothing other than how we've been doing it uh, in a way which is much more environmentally friendly and also looking at the end life of something. So particularly the whole idea that we might use nature itself to design and create for us, I thought was such a great thing if we can harness that as designers. 
Um, at the moment, in textiles, we grow crops like cotton, which uses up land and water. We add harmful pesticides. It has to be processed and transported, all of which, of course, is really problematic. So I was really keen to, to come up with some sort of organic um, alternative. Um, the, the process that David described to me as being a possibility um, that hadn't really been explored in any great depth for, for garments was something that involved using yeast and bacteria which are added to a sweetened tea mixture and the bacteria when they feed on the sugary tea the sugar is the nutrient in this liquid they spin pure cellulose and these fibers of cellulose when they're produced, stick to one another. And the more they stick to one another, they create layers. And the layers compact, and you end up with a material on the surface. So when you take that material out of the liquid, you can dry it down, and you end up with something which is somewhere between sort of papyrus, paper, or, or even like a leather. So this was something that we kind of thought might have possibilities. It's an incredibly old process. The whole um, basis for the recipe is something that is used in a, a health drink called kombucha. Um, this is a, a fermentation system that people all over the world actually use and drink on a, on a daily level. The bacteria are placed in this sweetened tea mix, produce all sorts of vitamins, minerals and enzymes that actually give it health giving qualities. So in ancient China, like it goes back to about 220 BC when this was sort of first recorded as a process. And it was described then as the tea of immortality. Um, but as I say, it's still something that goes on today. So you can go to your health food store and you can buy this actual liquid. Um, but what we're using is the, the culture that's produced during the course of this, this process. Um, this is the, so this is the tea drink, this is kombucha tea, but it's also in Indonesia consumed um, as, a, as a foodstuff. So the actual material, the gel that's produced on the top, is flavored with coconut milk and is actually eaten. And it's the only form of pure cellulose that the human body can, well, not digest, but you can consume it and it's not harmful to you. So it's used as a foodstuff there. This is um, the kind of system that we have, is just using slightly larger kind of growth baths. We brew up huge amounts of sweet tea, and the bacteria culture is dropped into this. And as you can see there, hopefully, it begins to start forming in a very short space of time. Um, we're growing kind of meter square sized sheets of it at the moment. And it takes about two weeks for the material to get to a sort of 12 millimeter thickness in its wet state. And then that's taken aside and can be dried down. Uh, one of the first things we did was to just take the wet sheet of material and place it over a three-dimensional form so that as it dries, it takes on the shape of something. And that worked really well, except that because the material doesn't have any flex, it won't spring. So if you, if you roll it up as a three-dimensional shape, it doesn't really return very well. So. But it loves to mold. And this is a shoe last with the wet material dried down on top of it. And it gives you the perfect kind of shape that, that it would take. So we thought that there were kind of possibilities for perhaps getting it to grow into the three-dimensional shape. So we were using things like body forms that we drilled holes in to let the liquid go through it. We tried submersing the form in liquid, allowing the liquid to come up from within. Didn't work. Tried spraying a system like a sort of irrigation system, just allowing small amounts of liquid to trickle down. But the problem that we kept coming up with was that in pipes and filters for the system, the cellulose grows so um, voraciously that anywhere where it was kind of having the, the nutrient running over it, it would begin to form cellulose, so it would clog the filters and it would clog the pipes and it would just grow wherever you put it, basically. So controlling the growth is the real kind of challenge. Um, 
This is kind of how we, we're currently drying the big flat sheets of it, which is that it, it loves to sort of stick really nicely onto a wooden surface. Um, so you can kind of see there that's when it's wet, you can really kind of stretch it and move it and really sort of work with it. But as it dries down, it really kind of grips and becomes a completely different kind of finish. Um, when it's wet, the, the weight of it sometimes means that it can go into holes. And we found that one way that we can counteract that is by creating like a wet cellulose plaster, literally by cutting off a bit of excess material and sticking that down on top. As it dries, it then kind of compacts back into the sheet and becomes once again part of the material. So it sort of got around that, the whole issue. Um, where we're at, at the moment is like the beginning of the project. So what we did to kind of test it is just taking the, the sheets that we've, we've kind of been trialing, which all vary at the moment depending on how much sugar we put in the solution. So some of the um, examples are very kind of paper-like, others are very kind of sticky and much stretchier. And we just put them into a really basic, simple garment because it already kind of informed us about how you can handle it in terms of machining it together. Um, trying to use a very traditional manufacturing process as the first off. Um, going forward, the real issues are going to be trying to, in a way, combat the problems that we have with it, which is that it doesn't stretch and therefore is really nothing like a, a normal textile, but also that it really is very um, absorbent of water, so that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It may well be that there are applications for clothing or textiles which go beyond um, a normal garment, so like a nappy, for example, where it's desirable to absorb a lot of water, it could be really useful for. Um, but basically, the, the project is, is uniting sort of fashion design and textile skills with uh, a biologist and hopefully ultimately uh, chemistry to look at the organisms involved in the growing process and see if we can actually get the organisms themselves to create a material which is what we what we really need and the kinds of qualities that we require so I've got a few kind of examples here the color is coming from the tea solution um, I think some of these early ones were grown in black tea, which gives it a darker color. Um, the samples we're using now are using green tea, which is kind of you know, lighter. It rips really easily, but at the same time, it's also really strong. So it has a kind of mix of qualities. Some of them are much softer. You can feel the kind of sticky quality to some of it. Um, if you bleach it, it becomes very brittle. What it does really take to is dyeing. So we've got um, samples that we've kind of dyed with vegetable dyes. And we've also tried, we put it through an inkjet printer and printed onto it. That works really well. Um, so it, I think it's got lots of potential. But as I say, it's very much at the beginning of the project. So hopefully in a year's time, we'll be a little bit further. But I've got some samples that I'll have a pass around. So that's kind of crispy. That's slightly stretchier and that's uh, the one in the bag don't give it too much of a squeeze because it might come out all over you but that's the wet gel before it gets dried so the smell is actually sugary tea um, there's lots of discoveries in this kind of process we've done um, I'll put these are the kind of colored ones Just sort of happy accidents as well, whereby you might put something on a, a wooden board which has got nails in it, and when it dries down over the nail, it suddenly turns black, so you realize that it's kind of phobic to metal, so you can't let it come into contact with metals. Or if you wanted to, of course, if you want it to, to dry black, then you dry it on a metal thing. So all these kinds of accidents help to inform the kind of creative aspects of it. That's... Uh, the print one, you can see um, where what the heat does. This is the heat of the roller where it's been through the inkjet printer. And that's just a sort of 
web page that's been printed out onto it. Um, that's basically all I have to sort of say so far on this, but if anybody's got any questions, I think we're in coffee break time. Break, uh, Susan. Uh, <laughs> Tea break. I'm, I'm, this I'm is um, beetroot. Um, there's a question from the audience. Just a second. I think it's a challenging thing you're developing, but you're opposing yourself in the introduction towards cotton. Uh, have you reflected on the environmental impact of this material, where you use juice, you brew the tea? So there's a lot of energy using here as well. So how is it, is it possible to make a balance against cotton? Well, in its most simple form, I mean, in, in Indonesia, it's grown in villages, in very unscientific um, environments. Anywhere where you've got all it actually needs is heat. So there's an op optimum temperature at which it grows, which is about 25 degrees. So in hot climates, it's fantastic because you can just literally put an ice cream container out in the hot sun and it will just do it on its own. Equally, in terms of drying, that's what it needs. What we've discovered is actually that you need very little liquid to, to, and it will keep growing. Um, and also that it's possible to recycle the liquid so that you can use the same, you can use a percentage of the same liquid again and again. So it really cuts down on the amount of fluid that you're using. Um, at the moment, we're using uh, nutrient in the form of white sugar because it's a really concentrated form of nutrient, um, which obviously is expensive and is not really um, what we'd like to be doing. So the laboratory where this project is based is also doing biocomposite work and they're looking at using um, the, the waste refuse from vegetables that aren't wanted or discarded and you putting that into biocomposites. And it may well be that we can use their waste stream from their biocomposite process as part of this. So potentially the two link together quite nicely. Uh, Susan, in addition to that, um when I read about your project and when you demonstrated and showed the samples, I was wondering if you're also planning to, to mix the material um, because the, the fluidity of the gelish uh, wet example has quite a, a lot of different uh, qualities uh, compared to what we see now, which is it's a bit difficult to understand the qualities in this given form. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your future plans? Well, I mean, even now, one, one way that a scientist or a material scientist might approach it is to look at ways of um, introducing various chemical finishes and processes to the surface of it. Um, and so we know that we can alter the properties by doing that quite easily with synthetic materials and with synthetic finishes and processes. But for me, the whole project um, needs to have an, a sort of sustainable compl you know, completeness to it. So I don't want there to be any level at which we begin to put you know, man-made chemicals or synthetic processing onto it. I'd like to keep it so that everything is coming from an organic base and therefore it can be recycled and reused. Um, and so the challenge is to make it entirely organic, really. Um, because we're not then going to be treating the finished surface, although that is one aspect that we can possibly do through design processes. Um, it's really going to come down to looking at the biochemistry of the organisms and how they work together and the balance of yeast and bacteria and how they kind of either get on or don't get on in terms of whether the material is given stretch or you know, how, how okay. harsh it is. Wow, that's exciting. Um, is there anybody with questions or remarks? It's getting a little warm here. <laughs> so I suggest you give a big hand for Suzanne. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this presentation. I'll briefly introduce myself, but it has already been done basically by uh, Suzanne, so I'll skip the whole part. Um, looking at the presentations and the material that you've seen today, actually I think this presentation uh, should be seen as a sort of an intermezzo 
which I think could best, best be characterized as uh, something completely different, as you will see. Um, because what I'd like to do today is to present you uh, some of the real-life examples of how our industry is trying to change and create innovative, uh, creative solutions for product concepts, yeah? and um, how we uh, have been working to, to match creativity, innovation, and uh, let's say the normal uh, R&D uh, efforts. The title is therefore chosen as Creative R&D Profitable Business. Uh, that's been done deliberately, and I hope to show you uh, during my presentation why I chose this title. Some words about uh, Cobalt, because I'm not sure if you know the company. Uh, Cobalt is a member of the Low and Bona Group. Um, we are the leading global uh, producer of various three-dimensional matrix products and all kinds of synthetic non-woven products. We headquartered in Amsterdam, uh, in Arnhem, in the Netherlands, and we have, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 parts located in Asheville, in the United States, in Obenburg, and for the matter in Emmen, which I forgot to put on the slide here. We are um, active in, uh, in a number of uh, customer groups. We have a very broad customer base. We're active in flooring, automotive, construction, building, industrial, and civil engineering. And during the course of my presentation, you will see a number of products uh, where these fit and how they are being applied there. Um, and on the next one, you see that we, what we do there is uh, providing uh, high-grade uh, backings for carpets. And I will show you later on what it looks like. Uh, trim elements for automotive and in also in the, in the flooring market. Um, reinforcements in roofings, in other construction industry markets, and hyper performance ventilation, insulation, and drainage products. Well, there's this a whole range of uh, products. Actually, this picture I like very much, because here you see how Colbeck, who uh, really looks like. On the right, you see the fibers, and uh, you see on the connection points there how they are melted and molten together. And on the left, you see that it is actually a bicomponent, meaning there is a polyester core, and there is a shell, as you can see there, of nylon or polypropylene. Uh, and here we are talking about diameters of, say, 30 to, well, say, one, uh, 30 to 100 micron. It is how our core product is being built. And I like the structure of it very much, because we can use it. And I will show you later on how. Well, some areas of application. Um, in, uh, in flooring, as I already said, uh, the material callback is being used for tufting. We directly tuft the yarn on the callback, and then later on, there are other layers are added. In automotive, uh, for instance, in automotive flooring, you see on the right uh, picture with the green and the yellow in there, it's a three-dimensional product, which is molded uh, with high pressure and temperature into its three-dimensional shape. Therefore, it, has a high, uh, it puts high demands on the quality and the mechanical properties of the coal bank. In construction, well, there's a long list of where it's being used, but it is, it is used in all kinds of, of, of applications where it needs to strengthen the final membranes or, or, or top layers or what have you. The other uh, range of products are the Enkamat products, and I deliberately show this to you because there are all kinds of interesting shapes, uh, three-dimensional structures that, that uh, will appear later on uh, in my presentation. Um, the Enkamat sort of type of products are being used in, in, in all kinds of uh, ventilation, uh, support uh, uh, applications, sound absorption, and it's even being used uh, to reduce the amount of polyurethane filler in all kinds of dashboard products in car industry. In civil engineering, it is being used as uh, erosion control, so it's put in the ground, and you put uh, soil on it, and so the ground is uh, stabilized. 
In addition to that, we have drain products, as you can see on the, on the bottom here, there, that is anchor drain. You put it also in the ground and it helps to control the uh, amount of moist and water in uh, around buildings, in civil engineering projects, airports, whatever. Uh, you should realize that this sort of products are being sold in millions of square meters per year. So there's a lot of stuff going into the ground, I assure you. Um, if, you, if you look at our R&D organization, and if you look at what we try to do, is that we continuously um, uh, look for uh, innovative products, to really bring creative innovativeness in our products. And um, we do that based on our existing expertise. And in our organization, we are very good in, in things like extrusion, spinning, um, fleecing. We can work with all kinds of synthetic materials and build and, and extrude and, and shape them into this sort of, of constructions. We can do that. But the point with our products is you never see them. I would be very surprised if you have actually seen one of our products actually in function, because they are either put in the ground and you put a meter of soil on them, or they are the backside of floor coverings, or they are inside interior trim elements. You never see them. What a waste of these beautiful structures. There is uh, another element uh, I think it's a very important dimension. We operate in a business-to-business -business setting. We do not deal directly. Ah, thank you. We do not deal directly with consumers. Always in the business-to-business -business settings. And we have a so-called install base in production technology. As I already said, we can produce millions of square meters a year on huge machines that have, are bigger than this uh, this this uh, this area here. So there are some questions there. If we, if we want to grow and if we want to really expand, can we do that? Can we create access to new markets? And while doing that, how smart are our products? Because nowadays we have to be smart, not only uh, as a company, but also in your products. There are many more questions, and I will show them later. We will come to them. All right, to give you an example, this is what we are good at. Producing millions of square meters on rolls. These rolls are then transported to end users and they do all kinds of things with them. And they are, well, they, they vanish out of the visible domain. So that's uh, how it looks like. We do, however, have a development strategy. And what you see here is, the, um, is, a, is a variant of the, the, of the so-called ends of matrix. You've probably seen it many times on the top you see our current markets, our new markets, and current is then split up in current applications and new applications. On the vertical you see technology, again split up in, in current and new. And then you see a yellow area, and that is the area that I'm active in. And you see also this cross there at the right, this little cross on new technology, new markets. We don't do that. That is too risky cost too much money, we think. And maybe you have some other clever ideas that make them change their mind. But considering the size of the company, Colbond is about 155 million uh, euro of turnover, we think that is too risky. Which leads me to a number of other questions. If you look at our current uh, product portfolio, we have to conclude that um, this bar is going away, I guess. Yeah, okay, well, you have to conclude that our technology and our product market tech, uh, combinations are basically mature, which is a problem because you have the risk of falling into the so-called commodity trap. And the commodity trap is a nasty thing. The nasty thing is that you have to invest a lot of money for only incremental uh, innovations. So you have to run very fast to practically stay in the same position. That's a, that's, that's a nasty one. Um, so we have a need for new, but preferably available technology uh, to meet our medium-term customer needs. And uh, we want to offer functionality through new, low-cost, efficient technology. That's a deliberate choice, by the way. That's a choice. We chose to do that. We chose to want that. 
but it requires us to strengthen our ability to access research that goes on in the outside world. That's an option, and we actually do that now. Translate trends in the world of our, uh, of our customers and develop creative, smart solutions, whatever that may be. But since this day, I may have some ideas. <coughs> to give you some idea of what the non-wovens industry that um, we think we are a member of has been doing in the past three years, and then I'm talking about research and development strategy here. That's elastic materials, biodegradable materials, composites, and all kinds of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, com uh, combinations. A broad application of spun lace technology, I don't want to go into that, that's it's a bit, bit of jargon, photoresist electronic material. That was in the past three years. In the next five years, however, it's all about micro and nanofibers. It must sound familiar to you. Uh, the further development of environmental, uh, environment, uh, environmentally friendly materials, of course, the whole trend of sustainability and demands in that area. Intelligent non-wovens. Well, we've seen a lot of intelligent stuff around here today, so there's a lot of uh, connections there. A new generation of breathable films and laminates and new web-forming systems. This, this list was not drawn up by us. This is the list that is drawn up by the global non-woven uh, branch uh, organizations, Edana. Frankly, I don't like trends. I'll, exp I'll explain to you why. Because if we, everybody follows trends, nobody is really innovative. We, do, we all end up with the same stuff. And uh, the risk is that we are being fooled by randomness. With that I mean that there's this little exception somewhere going on, this smart guy, this new Bill Gates, that comes up with something that we haven't thought of and wipes us away. He didn't follow trends. So that is difficulty there. So should we be doing what all others are doing, following all these trends? First mover advantage, because if you want to be the first mover following up these trends, you have to invest a lot of money in research and development. You have to be big. And then again, if we follow all these trends, how do we distinguish ourselves from our competitors? How, are we, how different are we? Um, so we should be looking for ideas outside the mainstream, outside the big trends, or maybe connect into a specific little trend that is not on this list of the research list of what our competitors are all doing. It's also an option. But it requires creative thinking and hard work. And these two are connected, as I hope to show you later on. In addition to that, we need a lot of innovative ideas. I mean, it's no surprise to you that you end and uh, maybe one implemented product into market, which is the result of a lot of creative e ideas, uh, things that are abandoned or looked at again in a, stuff, uh, in a sort of iterative process. Well, I'll come back to that later on. But this is practically still always the case. Um, I have a very simple model, considering what we've seen today, this is a very simple uh, picture. Uh, but in my view, uh, creativity, encompasses all other, um, let's say, activities that are related with, in the end, making money. And, ladies and gentlemen, the only reason that we exist is that we want to make money. We want to make a lot of money. We want to have high profits. Money is the only reason why we are in business, not for any other reason. But. That's not easy, because you still have to be creative. <laughs> and you have to be creative uh, in order to come up with good, innovative ideas. And you have to be creative for your market and your product development. And you have to be creative all over your organization. Otherwise, you will not be able to make one euro. And I'll come back to that later on. Um, so we said to ourselves, we have to be creative, we have to change our, 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 our perception. What is, what, what actually, what is it what, what we are doing? We are making this callback in millions of square meters uh, a year, and we have this huge installed base, large machines. Um, maybe we should have a different view of what we are actually doing. So what I, I'll, I'll do now in the next, say, 10 slides or so, I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we have been doing to 
change our perception of our products. This is callback. But now it's callback in blue. It's a nice product. In blue it looks even nicer because normally it's gray or black or white. You can have three choices, white, black or gray. Now we've made it in blue. It looks already slightly different. This is also a callback. What we can do in our production system is that if we can make one fleece five meters wide, we can also put a number of fleeces on top of each other. So it depends on how the machine is being constructed. But in between that, we can, do, we can put other material, wovens, all kinds of structures. That's what you see here. These are true layers of, of uh, callback, but in between you see some sort of a, 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 a woven structure. Well, you can also do that in black, of course, and then uh, you can coat it with some red and reddish materials. You simply say, okay, what is it callback anyway? What, what is it that we are, have been producing now for 30 years or more? You see, that if, you, if you visualize it like this way, it looks almost like a different product. But this is still callback with a simple woven in between. I've not mentioned this one before. That's also what we do, Enca grid. Enca grid is a... a well, it's not really a woven, it's, it's a structure of, uh, of uh, plastic stripes, black and, and uh, transparent. There's a reason for that that I cannot disclose here. Um, this is used normally for soil reinforcement. For instance, under runways and airports, you see this sort of stuff to hold uh, the uh, material together. This is a nice way of presenting it. Normally, it's on a boring roll, with, with meters of it. Then we said, okay, well, how, how can we make it look different, at least to ourselves? Maybe we come up with some, some, some ideas. What about Enkamat? And go back. We even may have, have uh, um, people involved in fashion asked uh, to make dresses of callback and design dresses. On the left, you see callback in its typical application in the roofing, that, I mean, we sell, I think, uh, I don't know how many millions of square meters are used on the left. But you can also make dresses out of it. You can also apply it in this sort of area. That gave us at least some idea of the versatility of the material. Wall coverings, it actually is being applied in that area. It is being sold to a specific application and is used as a wall covering. Well, the, the, these are the areas you can think of. But if you can make a non-woven and you can have all these wire, the, these threads and this nice fleece, you can also add other material uh, while making it. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a little gold wire <coughs> in, incorporated into the material. That, um, well, this is also being sold. This is also a product that's being marketed. It's used as a wrap, as a packaging material for flowers. Ankermat. If you look at Ankermat a bit more close, this funny three-dimensional structure, which is being used uh, to, 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 to have on, on dikes uh, to avoid materials and sand from slipping away. But if you look at it in more detail, it looks like that. Again, we ask the same designer to make a dress out of Ankermat. It also can be done. The most expensive part on this are the, are the pearls, of course, because Enkermet is such as a three-dimensional structure, it can be produced in millions of square meters in a very cost-effective way. Well, the, we did all kinds of, 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 of things to, 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 to alter our own view on the sort of product that we are looking at. This is all the sort of stuff that we can do, because we can extrude in a vertical way, and then you can come up with all this sort of figures, patterns, no matter what you, what you want, we can, we can do it. Then, uh, of course, the anchor drain. Anchor drain is one of those products that you say, hey, you have two layers. You have this uh, spacer in between where, where water flows through, but, but you have this sort of sandwich-like product. What else can you do with that? The, you can, the, uh, the bottom layer leaves uh, water through because the water flows in and then is moved away. The top one, there's a coating is, uh, because it, to avoid moisture reaching, for instance, a concrete wall. But can you add intelligence in these layers and do something with it? Well, 
Of course you can. We have seen that today, how, how we can do that. So that was a very useful day. So that, um, that gave us some ideas about uh, how our own products at least could look like. But the point is, of course, that we have uh, some paradigms. We have to do with some paradigms. And the, one of the paradigms is that innovation goes uh, from science through technology, through product to products by good planning, by uh, focusing on customer demands and customer needs. And then you end up with a product that makes a million. Simple. That's at least one paradigm. The other one is you have to be only be creative. I've seen a lot of it today. I mean, the only thing you have to do is be creative and make millions. Forget it. That's also a paradigm. I think you have to do both, in a, particularly in our business, in an R&D setting. Uh, you, need, you need both paradigms, but you don't need them as a paradigm, but as a system to work together. You can't produce, you cannot develop smart concepts without technology and production-oriented technology because we are still talking about million square meters because that's what we're good at. And you won't survive, we won't survive, I must say, without the smart or crazy ideas. And I'm convinced, as shown earlier, that we need creativity in all areas that we operate in. So there's, there's um, this, this old... When, you, when, you, when I prepared for this, as there's books full of schedules, how product development takes place. I mean, such parts of books, all kinds of... There's Delft system, what have you. What they all came up... Basically, they have this creative part, they have the technology part, and in between you make choices and product development. And then, of course, there's the outside world with teams and trends and what have you, and you have your company with management and organization, and somewhere there's a market where you make your, where you make your living. And I think we have seen today, if I may be so bold as to <laughs> summarize a bit, <laughs> that you need to have this holistic view. I mean, there is no way that we can continue working under the old paradigms with these split up uh, R&D departments, split, uh, di uh, isolated from all kinds of other activities, isolated from our uh, environment and outside world. No way, forget it. So this is how we are now thinking of, at least in Cobalt, that is, I'm, I'm still talking about the Cobalt uh, situation, I hope you appreciate that. Um, but the concept of about some 10 years ago, the holistic R&D, and actually that's what we are doing now. Uh, we are trying, really trying, not only trying, but have some success now of incorporating all these elements in our organization. We have a number of approaches, and I'll, I will show a few of them. One approach that we have a group of students uh, on, um, in the area of product design and, and uh, of the... Of the uh, uh, Hogeschool Arnhem Nijmegen, it's a group of 10 actually, um, working with us at the DIRC, at the Development and Application Centrum. They look at our products from a different way and they come up with all kinds of, of interesting, constructive ideas on how to um, further develop or make a variance of our existing products. So that's, that's, and we consider that a very interesting and useful exercise. It's appreciated very much in our organization and I believe that the students like it also. So that's a two-way thing then. The other approach, of course, is look very close at the um, research going on in the outside world. So what we're doing now is to, uh, um, of course, there's a university, uh, in our case, University of Trent is interesting because there's a chair of uh, textile materials, so that's for us an interesting one. And, um, but also very much look at this intermediate part where, uh, for instance, the Saxion, but also the other uh, universities of applied science are active, all kinds of institutes are active, and we want to tap into that. And um, that's actually what we are being doing now, and that is also my role in the, in the, in the, in the Saxion, is to, to, to bring all these sort of disciplines together uh, in a sort of, again, a sort of a holistic view, not only for the industry, but also for other companies uh, that want to work uh, with us. And, um, well, I hope I gave you some idea of uh, how at least our company, Cobalt, tried to, uh, to, to improve creativeness uh, as it uh, involved their uh, products. 
And um, I hope that also that there are a number of approaches, uh, a number of ways of doing that. Um, but looking at the outside world and asking for outside help is ab absolutely uh, mandatory to achieve any success. So thank you for your attention. That's very, very well on time. Um, before we take one or two questions for the, uh, from the audience, I have one, one question. Uh, maybe I didn't listen well enough, but it was not really clear for me what the role of these uh, fashion designers or the one uh, fashion designer uh, who, uh, who made the, the dresses with your, uh, with your products what exactly uh, are you planning to do with it? Was it uh, a kind of inspiration <laughs> yeah. for you? Okay. Yeah. It was okay. purely meant as inspiration. I mean, um, we are not in fashion in any way. But, mm -hmm. uh, but as I tried to explain, we, we wanted to, uh, with a group of people from external, uh, from external world, designers, creative, uh, artistic uh, people, looking at our products and see what you could do with them. So making. Uh, f f fashion products like dresses was one, but also all the other examples show you. There are actually, there are many more examples, but then my presentation would take two hours. So that, uh, I left out many of them. Nah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually really mm. curious to uh, hear about this, but maybe we can go into well, detail. They are later. behind this, so you have yeah. it in the computer yeah. here. Okay, <laughs> there's a question here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rick Wachter, Opalio. Um, how do you design the reverse loop of uh, ideas like crazy ideas or fashion ideas or application designs uh, back to production processes and material designs, mm. which is actually the business where you're in? Yeah. Well, that how, is. How do, you, how do you reverse the loop? That is um, the task of uh, R&D. Within R&D, we have uh, a number of activities. Um, product design, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, making derivatives of product is one, but if you think about products, we always think about processing and production as well, because it is completely useless in our point of, uh, of, uh, from, from our point of view to only talk about materials without taking into account the fact that you have to produce it. So materials, products, and product modifications, in our thinking, includes Processing. So you can see the way our products, are, projects, sorry, are set up, uh, are always uh, is always done in such a way that, uh, apart from the material developments and uh, and uh, and the way uh, we work with uh, new polymers or whatever, always includes already from from the start thinking about production, small scale, intermediate scale, etc. And if you would. And you're kindly invited to, to, to visit us uh, when, 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 when you want. Um, if you look at our development application center, we have our own pilot plant fleecing machines where we make our fleeces, and that is being used very intensively because all our modifications are either extruded, like the anchor mat, or made as, as fleeces. Yeah. There's more, one more question. Does that answer your question, yeah. by the way? Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Maybe to be precise, Your special, your Michiel, specialty, don't show so loud. Your specialty is in non-woven. So if a designer has a question that can be, which leads to a non-woven, they can go to you. If they need something with color, they need some to go somewhere else. If they need mm. to go for composite materials with carbon fibers, they go need somewhere else. So basically, there is a kind mm. of fix. I mean, you you are fixed mm. in let's say high cost investments, uh, which let's say yeah. selects what you're interested yeah. in, and let's say this audience need, needs to be go to a ra wide, wide range of addresses when they want to scale up, let's say, their concept yeah. into, into products. But th this is true, of course. Um, but we also have uh, quite an effective R&D organization and a lot of expertise in making all kinds of um, product modifications on a laboratory scale, um, which, uh, which uh, have never reached production. So there's a lot of expertise also in, in let's say, uh, making derivatives of existing products with uh, different compositions and, and stuff like that and also already connected that with the possibility of producing them on a large scale. Yeah. A big hand again for you. Thank you. And, um, <laughs>